All right, welcome back. Last lesson, we learned how to evaluate simple limits, but unfortunately, not all limits are simple. So we're gonna be looking at five methods that we use to evaluate limits, including the one you already know. And that is method number one, our plugin method. And we'll briefly focus on that because the main focus of this lesson are the next four methods for when plugging in doesn't initially work. So that brings us to our second method of factoring, and we can use factoring in certain cases to make a limit simpler, or we can use expanding, which is our third method that may also make a limit easier to evaluate. And then we have rationalizing. Maybe we have a limit with square root functions that seems pretty difficult. We can rationalize to make that easier. And we can also use a common denominator method that allows us to simplify lots of fractions. So let's look at each of these methods in action. First, we have the method you're already familiar with. We'll go through this pretty quick, but I still wanna cover it, and that is the plug-in method. So here I have the limit as x approaches four of x squared minus two x plus one. And just like the name of the method says, we're going to plug in our value of x that we're approaching. In this case, that value is four. So we'll say that this is equal to four squared minus two times four plus one. And that can be simplified to 16 minus eight plus one, which is then equal to nine. So that's the plug-in method. But now let's look at our more complicated methods. So next we're gonna look at our factoring method. And our factoring method is useful when we have terms in our function that can be factored to simplify it. But first, let's look at why we even need to do this in the first place. So if I were to just to plug in three into our limit here, we have our limit as x approaches three of x squared minus nine all over x minus three. If we were to plug three into this function, we're gonna have three minus three on the bottom, three squared minus nine on the top, and that's going to result in nine minus nine on the top, so zero, divided by three minus three, which is also zero. So we have an undefined value here, and this is not what we want. This is not an answer to this limit. In fact, we call this an indeterminate form because we can't determine the limit in this function's current state. So what we're gonna have to do is manipulate it in some way, and that is going to be the theme throughout this entire lesson. What can we do to our function to manipulate it so that we can plug in our value of x that we're approaching? And that leads us to our first one here, which is factoring. Because if I look at my function here, I have a difference of squares here on the top that I can factor. So I'm gonna do that. So this would be equal to the limit as x approaches three, and I'm gonna factor my difference of squares here to x plus three and x minus three. Remember that x squared is a squared term, and we also have nine, which is three squared. And so that means we have a difference of squares, which is how we get this, if you recall from algebra. And then we have our x minus three on the bottom. So then we have an x minus three in the top and the bottom that we can cancel out. And that's going to leave us with the limit as x approaches three of x plus three, right? Because we canceled this term and this term, all that we have left is this x plus three. And now we can plug in our value of x. We can plug in three, and there's not gonna be an undefined value or an indeterminate form. So we can plug in, and we'll get three plus three, which is equal to six. So that's an example of our factoring method. Next, we're going to be looking at our third method of expanding. And in this case, we're going to be interested in the limit as x approaches zero of the quantity x plus one squared minus one all divided by x. And so we'll start this one the same way we started the last limit where we plugged in our value of x to see what's going to happen. So I'm gonna plug in zero minus one all divided by, uh-oh, zero, right? So we've already got a problem, but I'm still gonna go through the top anyway just to see what happens. And we're gonna have this one squared here, zero plus one is one. So one squared minus one is also zero. So we'll have zero over zero which again is an indeterminate form. We cannot determine the limit as the function currently stands. And so what can we do this time since we cannot plug in? Well, I don't see anything I can factor, but I do see something that I can expand, particularly this part of the function right here, our x plus one quantity squared. So let's expand that and see what that allows us to do. So I'll rewrite the limit as x approaches zero, and now I'm going to square this term up here 
For this example, I am going to show each term in case you're just curious, where does the full expansion come from? But in the future, I probably won't show every single one of these steps. So we'll have x squared plus x plus x plus one, and that all came from this quantity squared, our expanding process. But we can't forget about this negative one right here. So then we'll have minus one. And this is all still going to be over x. So remember when you are squaring a quantity like this, we first square our x, right? We multiply x by itself to get this term. And then we have this term times this term, which is this right here. And then we have this term times this term, to have this. And then we have this term squared, and one squared is one. So that's where all of our terms came from in our expanding process. So now let's simplify. And so I will write the limit as x approaches zero of x squared plus two x, remember, because we have two different x's here that we can add together, plus one minus that one, don't want to forget that, and then we'll have that it's still over x. So then these two ones here will cancel out because plus one minus one is zero. And then we'll be left with the limit as x approaches zero of x squared plus two x divided by x. Now, if we were to plug zero in at this point, we would still get an indeterminate form because zero would be on the bottom in the denominator. However, I do see something that can still be simplified. I see that every term in my function has an x in it so I can reduce it by that factor of x. So now I can rewrite my limit as x approaches zero of x plus two over one, right? If I take an x out of x squared, I'm left with an x because x times x is x squared. Remove one of those x's and we just have x. If we remove an x from our two x term, we just have two. And then since we took the only thing out of the denominator that was there, we're gonna be left with just one because one times x would be x. So if you remove that x, we still have one. And now we can plug in zero because we could actually rewrite this as just x plus two because anything divided by one is just itself, right? So now we can plug in and we'll have zero plus two equals two. And a quick note, if you noticed, every time we rewrote our limit, I kept the limit notation with our function. It never disappeared until we plugged in our value of x. And that's very important when you're showing your work always be sure to carry over that limit notation until you are able to plug in. But anyway, that's the end of our example on how expanding can be helpful to evaluating a limit. So our next method is rationalizing. And this is useful when we have limits of functions where we have square roots. So here's an example of that. We have the limit as x approaches zero of the square root of x plus three minus the square root of three divided by x. So just like we did with the other examples, let's start by plugging in zero and see if we have to do anything to this. So I'm gonna start and we'll have the square root of zero plus three minus the square root of three over, uh-oh, zero once again. So that's a problem, but we'll still go through at the top just so we see what we will get. And we're gonna have the square root of three minus the square root of three. So that's going to be zero over zero once again, which is indeterminate form. We cannot determine the limit so that's why we have to use some method to manipulate this function. We're not just doing this for fun, we are manipulating these because we have to if we want to evaluate the limit. So what can we do in this case? I'm going to remove our little bit of work here, although that is important to show. And so this time, since I see we have square root functions, I'm going to rationalize. And if you remember, when we rationalize a term like this, the method we're going to be using is multiplying by a form of one that uses the conjugate of the part of our function that has a square root in it. So in this case, the square root terms that we're interested in is the square root of x plus three minus the square root of three. And so what we're going to do is we're going to multiply by its conjugate. And if you don't remember, the conjugate is just the same thing as this, but we're swapping the sign, meaning that instead of subtraction, we're gonna be using addition. So this is what it looks like. We'll have the square root of x plus three plus the square root of three rather than minus. And then we have to multiply by a form of one. So we have to put this on the bottom of our fraction as well. So we'll also have the square root of x plus three plus the square root of three. And now let's multiply and see what happens. So I'll write the limit as x approaches zero. 
and we'll do the bottom, we'll do the denominator first, because that's a little bit easier. We'll have x multiplied by that whole denominator over there. So we'll have the square root of x plus 3 plus the square root of 3. And I'm not going to bother to distribute that right now, because we actually won't have to, and you'll see that in a little bit. So then we're going to multiply these terms by these terms. And remember, when you multiply something by its conjugate, you're going to get a nice answer where some things cancel out. But in case you don't remember, I am going to show all the terms this time so that you can see what happens and why we even do this to begin with. So we'll multiply this term by this term. And when you multiply the square root of something by itself, you're just going to have that term, so x plus 3. Then we'll have this term multiplied by this term. So we'll have plus the square root of 3x plus 9. And then we'll have this term times this term, so we'll have minus the square root of 3x plus 9. And then we'll have this term multiplied by this term. So we're going to have minus the square root of 3 times the square root of 3, which is 3. So now what we'll see is that these two terms in the middle are going to cancel out. And that's the beauty of rationalizing. What you'll notice is that what we're left with on the top is just this part squared minus this part squared. So that's kind of the trick to doing this quickly, but I did want to show you all of the steps so that you saw why and where that comes from. So we can reduce this, and this is going to be equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of x plus 3 minus 3 over x times the square root of x plus 3 plus the square root of 3. And now I see that this 3 and this 3 are going to cancel because positive 3 minus 3 is 0. So then we can simplify again. We'll have this is equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of x divided by x times the square root of x plus 3 plus the square root of 3. And now we have a common factor of x in the top and the bottom. So we'll cross those two out and now we can simplify even further. So now we'll have the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 divided by the square root of x plus 3 plus the square root of 3. And so now we can actually plug in our value of 0. If you noticed up until this point, we couldn't plug in 0 because we, that x caused us to have 0 in the denominator. But if we plug in x now, we won't have that issue because 0 plus 3 is the square root of 3 because 0 plus 3 is 3 and then we'd have another square root of 3 to add it to. So then this would be equal to 1 over 2 times the square root of 3, because we'd have the square root of 3 plus the square root of 3. And this would be our final answer. However, if you like to rationalize, you can rewrite this to be the square root of 3 over 6. And rationalizing your answer is as simple as multiplying the top and bottom of this answer by the square root of 3. So whatever square root is in the denominator, you would multiply the top and the bottom by it to get this. So it all depends on what kind of answer you like to give at the end, whether it be unrationalized or rationalized. I personally don't care. I would leave it as this, but some would prefer that you use this answer. Either way, they're both correct in that they have the same value. And so that was our method of rationalizing and how we use it to solve a limit that we initially couldn't plug into. Finally, we have our example for our common denominator method. So we have the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over x plus 3 minus 1 third all divided by x. So this looks a little intimidating because you have a lot of fractions going on, but that is exactly why the common denominator method is useful here because we have two fractions here in the top that maybe we can combine by getting a common denominator. But before we do that, let's see why we have to do that. Let's plug in our zero as it stands. So we'll have one over zero plus three minus one third all divided by zero again, which means we're gonna have to do something to this function. But if we reduce the top, we have one third minus one third all divided by zero. So we're gonna have zero divided by zero, which again is our indeterminate form. Our limit cannot be determined in the function's current state, so we have to manipulate it somehow. So once again, I'm gonna clear this out. Although that is important to show, I'm going to need the space here to show you how we do this method because well, we couldn't plug in, and if we look at this function, there's nothing we can factor, there's nothing we can expand, and there's no square roots to rationalize, so our only method now is the common denominator method. So let's go through this. The first thing we want to do is we want to get a common denominator for these two parts of this function. So you want to ask yourself, what does this denominator have that this doesn't, and what does this denominator have 
that this one doesn't. And, that, and what I mean by that is in terms of multiplication. So you can't just add an x to the bottom here. That's that's not a legal move. But what you can do is multiply each of these fractions by the other's denominator in a form of 1. So this is what that looks like. We'll have x on the bottom, and then we'll have 1 over x plus 3 times 3 over 3 minus 1 third times x plus 3 over x plus 3. So what we did is we took the denominator of this fraction and multiplied it by this one right here in the form of 1. So we took 3 and multiplied it by this in the form of 3 over 3, which is equal to 1. So we are allowed to do that. And then for this one, we multiplied by this denominator. We have x plus 3 in the form of 1. We have x plus 3 over x plus 3. And that is going to give us the same denominator in each part of these fractions. So now let's simplify. This will be equal to the limit as x approaches 0. And it's all going to be over x. We'll have 3 over 3 times x plus 3 minus x plus 3 all over 3 times x plus 3. So now these two parts have the same denominator, so we can combine the tops. So let's do that and simplify even further. We'll have the limit as x approaches 0 all over x of 3 minus, and this is important, this is a whole quantity that we were subtracting, so do not write this. That would be wrong. What you need to add are these parentheses. Now it's correct. Do not make that mistake or you will get an incorrect answer. So please, when you subtract a quantity like this, make sure that you subtract both parts, not just the x. All right, and then this is all going to be over that 3 times x plus 3. So now let's distribute this and then we'll simplify even further. We'll have the limit as x approaches 0 of 3 minus x minus 3 all divided by 3 times x plus 3 divided by x. And now we have a positive 3 and a negative 3 that are going to cancel out. So we'll do that. And then we will rewrite once again. We'll have the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x divided by 3 times x plus 3 divided by x. And so now what's the next step? What can we do to simplify this even further? Well, I see that we have this x up here and we have this x down here. So likely something is going to cancel out somewhere. So let's rewrite this by remembering that technically we have this quantity divided by this quantity where x is over 1. So we'd have two fractions that we're dividing in a way. We have this fraction divided by this fraction. So we can rewrite that because if you remember, when dividing fractions, you can actually just multiply the top fraction by the reciprocal of the bottom fraction. So that's what we're going to do here. We will write that this is equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x over 3 times x plus 3 multiplied by the reciprocal of this quantity, which is 1 over x. Remember, the reciprocal is flipping the numerator and the denominator. So then if I look at this, I see we have an x here and an x here that can be canceled out. So I'll do that. And now we'll simplify it again. We'll have the limit as x approaches 0 of negative 1. Remember, we didn't get rid of this negative, just the x. So then this is divided by 3 times x plus 3. And so now that we no longer have a single x term by itself in the denominator, we can finally plug in 0 and evaluate our limit. Because if we plug in 0 here, we're just going to have 0 plus 3 times 3, which is 9. And we're dividing that into negative 1. And so this is going to be equal to negative 1 divided by 9, or negative 1 ninth. And so that is our example for the common denominator method. So now you've seen all five methods in action, and now you're ready to maybe practice some more. So I will have the link to the examples video in the description of this, as well as linked at the end of this video. So if you wanna see some more examples, I really suggest that you go watch that as well. But for now, that's all I have. So I will see you next time.